All right, guys, let's talk about vectors. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to learn about uh, what vectors are and then how to perform operations with them graphically. And later on, we're going to learn how to do vector operations algebraically as well. Um, we've got a lot of vocabulary we've got to pick up here. Um, some new things. First of all, what is a vector? A vector is a quantity that has both magnitude and direction. For instance, if I said uh, 50 pounds, well, that's just a scalar quantity. It just has magnitude. But if I said I was pushing with 50 pounds um, in a northeasterly direction, now all of a sudden we have a vector. And so the way we draw a vector is using that magnitude. The magnitude of a vector is the amount of the given quantity. In that last example, that would be the 50 pounds. And when we draw them, we represent uh, the magnitude by the length of the drawn vector. So we draw vectors as arrows. And so, for instance, that might be 50 pounds, right, in that direction. If I wanted to push with twice as much force in the same direction, I would draw my vector like that. It would represent perhaps 100 pounds. And the direction is the angle that your vector forms with respect to a given reference. You have different ways that you can reference angles. You know, we could say, if we were to just draw an origin right through here, we could say, well, this uh, counterclockwise angle theta is, uh, if I called that my x-axis, I could say that's my direction of my vector. But Oftentimes, we also might use geographic directions. We might say this is north, meaning that x is east. And if you define it as a bearing, you might say north, this many, I'll call this alpha, north, alpha degrees east to define the direction of the vector. So there's a few different ways you can, you can do that. Um, but the important thing is that you give it some reference with respect to some reference plane. And then we're going to talk about resultant. And resultant is the sum of two or more vectors. And this is when vectors become really powerful for us because we can calculate things like, for instance, if I have my car, here's my car stuck in the ditch, and uh, I've got a piece of rope and you've got a piece of rope, and you're pulling in this direction with 100, 100 pounds of force, and I got a piece of rope and I'm pulling in this direction with perhaps 150 pounds. And we can use vector operations to figure out the resultant. In other words, if you pull that way and I pull this way, the car is going to go or it's going to experience a force that is going in some other direction and has some other quantity. That's our resultant. And we're going to figure out how to figure these out graphically and how to calculate them algebraically. Um, there's two methods for finding resultants, uh, at least graphically, and we're going to talk about those. I've got a sketch that'll make those easier to understand. Parallelogram method and the triangle method. And when we're talking about a vector, we have initial point and terminal point. If I draw my vector like that, there's my initial point. That's the point where it starts. And here's my terminal point. Okay. And then standard position. Standard position is when you draw a vector with its initial point at the origin. So if I draw my vector with my initial point at the origin in standard position, all I need to know are the coordinates x comma y of the terminal point and I know everything there is to know about that vector. I can calculate what its angle is. I can calculate what its magnitude is, what its length is, using the distance formula. Um, and we also have component form, and this is a way to describe a vector uniquely. Um, we, have, we write coordinates like this, x comma y, right? Well, component form, Component form we write like this with square brackets, delta x, comma, delta y. 
And for those of you who aren't familiar with delta x, delta y, or if you forget, that's the same as x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1, if you're looking at the coordinates of the initial point and the terminal point. All right, that's our vocabulary for vectors. Let's try a couple problems. All right, I got a couple problems here. They want us to use a ruler and a protractor to draw each vector and include a scale on each diagram. So this is vector S. So that's another thing that we probably should have defined in our vocabulary. S, that little arrow up top tells you that S is not just any old variable, it's a vector. Uh, so this is vector S, which is 80 meters at 24 degrees west of north. Okay, so what I want to do here is, since it's going to be west of north, I'm going to draw just a little uh, coordinate plane here. And I'm going to use for my y-axis, I didn't show up very well, did it? I'm going to use as my y-axis, I'm going to call that north. Okay, so there's north. And so if we're going to do this at 80 meters at 24 degrees west of north, I'm going to put my uh, protractor on here, and I'm going to try to find 24 degrees west of north. So I'm going to go 90, 100, 110, there's 20, and there's 4, 24 degrees west of north. And I'm just going to connect that with the origin, and that gives me, that gives me the line on which my vector is going to fall. Now how long should I make this vector? 80 meters. I'm going to choose a good scale. If I made it, uh, if I said one inch equals 80 meters, yeah, let's use that as a scale. One inch equals 80 meters. Then I could go ahead and mark it right there. And I could put my arrow right there. And there's my vector. There's my vector S. Okay. Darken it up a little bit. That's vector S. Okay, and you might want to label it like this, 24 degrees. Okay, um, could we do the same thing for vector D here? Vector D is <clears throat> 16 yards per second. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a speed. And this is another really good unit <clears throat> for vectors is speed, because when you turn it into a vector, we call it velocity. Once we add the direction, now we're dealing with velocity. And there's a lot of really cool calculations you can do with velocity vectors. They want this to be drawn at 165 degrees to the horizontal. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to just call this my origin. And I'm going to say 165 degrees to the horizontal. I'm going to start at x here and I'm going to go 165 degrees all the way around to hey right about there on that inner circle I can hit that right there and then when I connect these two I get I get that line now how long do I want to make this 16 yards per second if I said I could draw this at uh, two inches long I might get a little bit different this time. I'm drawing it two inches long. That's my vector. And I'm going to say that is <clears throat> my 165 degrees to the horizontal. And my scale is going to be, since I drew it two inches long, I'm going to say one inch equals eight yards per second. Good. All right. That's how we graphically draw vectors. All right. Let's try one more problem where we graphically draw a vector. Here they want us to use a ruler and protractor to draw a vector to represent vector n. Don't forget that little arrow up there tells us that that's not just any old variable. n is a vector. And vector n is 90 feet per second, 25 degrees east of north. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and call this north. 
and this east. Okay. And this vector is going 25 degrees east of north. So I'm going to go ahead and put my uh, protractor on my origin here and try to line that up. Oops, that's getting hard. There we go. I think I got it. And I'm going to go north and I'm going to go 25 degrees towards the east. So it's going to pass through that point right there. I'm going to connect those and just make a just make a faint line and then I'll decide where to put my arrowhead on that line to represent 90 feet per second. Um, and probably maybe I could say I don't know I could say one inch equals 50 feet or we could use millimeters as well and we could say we could actually go right out to nine centimeters look at that we could do that because then <clears throat> one centimeter equals 10 feet per second right if i've got nine centimeters that represents 90 feet per second and one centimeter represents 10 feet per second i can put my arrow there and darken that up and that is my oops i slid off a little bit that is my vector and it is 25 degrees north or east of north all right so now we're going to talk about finding resultants uh, when we have two or more vectors um, so if we have these vectors a and b again don't forget this is our initial point and this is our terminal point for vector b here's a vector a and if we want to find if we put these two vectors together where would the result be there's these two methods we can use one's the parallelogram method for the parallelogram method you're going to take vector b and you're going to translate it so its initial point is coincident with the initial point of vector a sort of like i've done down here in this sketch so i've slid um, vector b over to vector a and as long as i translate it and i don't rotate it i haven't changed the the vector at all it still has the same direction still has the same magnitude so i can do that and then i can <clears throat> go ahead and complete a parallelogram by drawing opposite sides that are the same same direction and same length as these two vectors this side of the parallelogram is parallel and congruent to vector b and this side of the parallelogram is parallel and congruent to <coughs> uh, vector a so mark it like that and when you draw that parallelogram the diagonal of the parallelogram represents the resultant if you added these two vectors together this is what you would get or if you were pulling in this direction with this amount of force and I was pulling in this direction with a slightly larger amount of force, the object we were pulling on would want to go in that direction with that much force. That's what that represents. Now there is another method you can use and you can use either one. I kind of prefer the parallelogram method, but the triangle method works as, as well. Instead of translating vector B so that its initial point is coincident with the initial point of vector a we <clears throat> translate it so that its initial point is coincident with the terminal point of vector a and then all you have to do is draw from the initial point of vector a to the terminal point of vector b and you have the resultant of vector a plus vector b notice <clears throat> it gives you the exact same result as if you did the parallelogram method it's just slightly different okay here could we find the resultant of vector a plus vector b so what i'll do is i'm going to i'm going to move i'm going to translate vector b it's about one uh looks like one and five eighths inches and I'm going to try to keep this parallel and try not to twist it. I'm just going to draw a vector B right here. 
and five eighths inches long. Good. So there's this vector B. I've translated it. And I'm going to go ahead and use my parallelogram method. I'm going to try to just keep this parallel here. And I'll draw a parallel line that's congruent right there. And you can see this would be the other side of the parallelogram right there. So my diagonal would be the resultant. Here we go. This is, and I would label that vector A plus vector B. That is the resultant. So if I was pulling this way and you were pulling that way, whatever we're pulling on would want to go in that direction with that much force. Guess what? We can subtract vectors as well. I can find vector A minus vector B. And here's our hint. Subtracting a vector is equivalent to adding its opposite. Okay, so if I were to use that parallelogram method again, I could go ahead and translate my vector B over here, about 1 and 5 eighths inches long. Okay, that's my vector B. If that's vector B, guess what negative B would look like? Negative B would go in exactly the opposite direction. So I'm going to just extend that line out in the other direction, 1 and 5 eighths inches this way. This is negative B. Okay. So if that's negative B, I'm going to go ahead and just try to slide this over and make my, make my parallelogram a quick, uh, quick line there. And I'm going to slide this up until I hit here. And then the diagonal of that parallelogram is the resultant that I'm looking for. Okay, there we go. I'm going to label it. That is vector A minus vector B. Good. So if I was um, pulling in this direction and we wanted to subtract the force that you were exerting or pull you were going to pull in the opposite direction the resultant would be vector a minus vector b would go in that direction with that amount of force all right they want us to write the component form of vector a b so don't forget component form looks like this it's delta x comma delta y if you prefer you could call it x2 minus x1 comma y2 minus y1 both of those are valid uh, especially if it's graphically plotted i just like to look at it and say okay here's my initial point i'm going to start there that's where we start and i'm going to go over and up to get to here so my delta x here was negative four now remember when we're doing distance formula oftentimes we forget about that sign because gets squared. Your delta x and delta y gets squared in the distance formula. This is not the distance formula. We're just looking at the difference, the change in x. So we got to keep that sign. So this is negative 4. And then we go up. So our delta y is positive 3. So the component form of this would be delta x is negative 4. Delta y is positive 3. Okay. That describes a vector that starts at some point in space and goes over 4 in the x and up 3 in the y. That's what component form does for us. All right, how about component form for this guy? If I start at the initial point 
it looks like I go over 2 in the x, delta x equals 2. And I go up 1, 2, 3, 4, delta y equals 4. So I'm looking for something that has a delta x of 2 and a delta y of 4. How does this guy look? All right, they want us to find the magnitude and direction of vector s with this component form, 7, negative 5. And I'll tell you, these are easiest to do if you put them in standard position. Do you remember what standard position is? That is when we put the initial point at the origin, and then we draw the vector accordingly. So why don't we call this... I'll call this my y-axis right here. Okay, that's y. Good. And then if this is our initial point for vector s, then the terminal point is going to be over 7, down 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's my delta x. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, down negative 5 is my delta y. And that gives me this vector right here. Good. That is vector s. How do I find the magnitude of vector s? Well, conveniently, we already have the pieces that we need to plug into, you guessed it, if we want to find the length of this line, we want to use the distance formula to find the distance between that point and that point. And our distance formula is, don't forget, the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Or, the version I prefer, distance equals the square root of the change in x squared plus the change in y squared. Oops, I forgot a parenthesis up there, sorry. Change in y squared. Since this is change in x, change in y, delta x, delta y, we can go ahead and just find our distance here straight away. Our, our length of our vector, the magnitude of our vector, is going to be the square root of 7 squared plus negative 5 squared. So I get distance equals the square root of 49 plus 25. So our distance here is going to be the square root of 74, is that right? Okay, so that's our magnitude, that's how long our vector is. They also want us to find the direction. How do we want to do direction? Do you want to just say, let's find direction from the horizontal, we'll call this x. Could we find this angle, I'll call it theta. Can we find this angle theta here? How would we do that? Well, what if I broke this down into a right triangle? Because that's what our component form allows us to do. Break it down into delta x and delta y. Sides of this right triangle are 7 and 5, right? If I know these sides, how do I find that angle? I'll give you a little hint. So, ka, toa, which one of these should we use? Which one of these should we use? I've got, with respect to this angle, I've got the opposite side and the adjacent side, okay? opposite and adjacent. So I'm going to use the tangent function here. So I could say the tangent of theta equals opposite over adjacent 5 over 7. Okay, so could I say that theta is an angle whose tangent is 5 sevenths? Use that inverse tangent function. So I'm going to do second function tangent to get that inverse tangent, 5 divided by 7, and I get theta equals 35.5 degrees. Okay, so I would say that it is 
35.5 degrees from the horizontal. You might say that it is 35.5 degrees south of east. You could say that as well. You could also find the complementary angle here, which would be 54 and a half. And if you want to write it as a bearing, that's how you would write it. You would say, this is south. I'm looking south, and then I turn 54.5 degrees towards the east. All different ways that you can reference the direction of that vector. Okay, could we do the same thing for this one? Let's practice one more of these. We've got this uh, vector D, and it has a component form negative 4, negative 4. So let's go ahead and draw our y-axis here, and we'll draw our x-axis here. Cool. And... Um, if we put this in standard position, we can put our initial point at the origin, and then we go, this is, don't forget, delta x and delta y. I'm going to go over 4 in the negative direction, 1, 2, 3, 4, and down 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So my terminal point is going to be right there, and that gives me, there's my vector right there. That's my vector d. Good. How do I find the magnitude? of my vector d. Well, I already have delta x and delta y. I can say the distance equals the square root of the change in x squared plus the change in y squared. So I'm going to get the square root of 16 plus 16. This is going to be the square root of 32, which you might say, hold on, we can simplify that. We can factor that back out to the square root of 16 times 2. And we can say our distance is the square root of 16 times the square root of 2, if you want to take it one more step, equals 4 square roots of 2. Good. That's our distance. That is our magnitude of our vector. How do we find the direction? All right, if you want to reference this from the horizontal, it's going to be 180 degrees plus this angle theta here. We could come all the way around. Or you could say it is uh, theta degrees south of west. If you wanted to call this south in west, you could do that too. But either way, we still got to find this angle theta. And if we drop in our right triangle here, hopefully we remember the sides of that triangle were 4 and 4. That was our delta x and our delta y from our component form. So, theta is an angle whose tangent is 4 over 4. So, theta is an angle whose tangent is 4 over 4. If you want to write out the tangent of theta first and then skip over to the inverse function, you can do that too. You can say the tangent of theta is 4 over 4. And then you can go to your next step. So, 4 over 4 is just 1, isn't it? What is the inverse tangent of 1? What angle has a tangent of 1? That is that very special angle, 45 degrees. Okay, that's 45 degrees. You could say that this is heading 45 degrees south of west or 45 degrees west of south. Or you could say it is 180 plus 45. So this angle with respect to the x-axis comes all the way around to here. And that is 225 degrees. All different ways to reference the direction of that vector. All right, when we get dealing with really complex vectors and we want to actually do calculations with them, um, fortunately, we don't always have to draw them out graphically and find resultants that way. We can use these properties of vector operations. If we happen to know the component forms for both vectors that we're dealing with, let's say that this is one vector and this is another vector, um, then we can add those two vectors together. To add this vector plus that vector, I simply add their delta x components to get my new delta x, and I add their delta y components to get my new delta y. 
So adding vectors together, very intuitive, just add their components. If I'm subtracting this vector from this other vector, again, very intuitive, I'm simply going to subtract those components to get my new delta x for my resultant. I'm going to take the delta x of my first vector and subtract the delta x of my second vector. And likewise, do the same thing to get my delta y for my resultant. Now, we can also scale up or scale down vectors. We can multiply them by some scalar quantity k. We can double them, triple them, quadruple them. And this is how it would work, basically, if I'm going to multiply a vector by a scalar. You can think of it as kind of like distributing the k into the component form. Uh, you're basically going to multiply that delta x by k and multiply the delta y by the same factor. If you multiply them both by the same factor, the direction won't change. That line that represents it will still have the same slope on the xy plane. Let's look at a couple of examples. All right, here they want us to find vector x plus vector y if these are our component forms for, for vector x and vector y. Um, let's do it algebraically first, and then we'll graph it and see if we get the same thing. So our component forms, we should be able to simply add them together. And we should end up with our resultant vector x plus vector y. Negative 1 plus 3 gives me 2. Okay. And when we look at our delta y components, 4 plus 1 gives me 5. Okay. So let's go ahead and plot this out. Let's put these guys in standard position and see where they're going to fall. Just draw this really quickly. Here's our y axis. And here's our x axis. Good. And let's plot vector x. If we put it in standard position, then we go negative 1 up 4. Okay, so there's, there's vector x right there. which is good, good. Okay, so that's vector x, good. And vector y is 3, 1, so over 3, down 1, if we also put that in standard position. And there is vector y, good. And we found that the resultant vector was 2, 5. Let's see if that makes sense. Over 2, up 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Good. Okay. Now, if this is right, and, and this is one of the reasons why I like the parallelogram method, is because in the parallelogram method, you get to put, if you put them both vectors in standard position, then it sets you right up for the parallelogram method. So let's go ahead and see, do we in fact have a parallelogram all right let's try this one they want us to find um, vector x plus vector y for if vector x has this component form and vector y has this component form so what they're asking here is find the resultant and so from our vector operations, we should be able to figure out that we can add these delta x components. Negative 1 plus 3 gives me 2. And we can do the same for our delta y components. 4 plus 1 gives us 5. Okay, so can we check this graphically? Why don't we go ahead and plot each of our vectors. Vector x if we put it in standard position, is going to be, we're going to go over 1, up 4. So the terminal point of vector x would be right there. Okay, there's vector x. And vector y is at 3, 1, over 3, and up 1. Okay, here's vector y. And... 
Good. So <clears throat> we figured out from our vector operations that the resultant should be 2, 5. So if we put that in standard position and then go over 2 and up 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that should be the terminal point of our resultant. And what you're seeing here is one of the reasons why I like the parallelogram method, because when you put everything in standard position, you're ready to draw a parallelogram to confirm to confirm your calculations. You can see our parallelogram here checks out and confirms that those algebraic vector operations do in fact work. All right, could we do the same thing here for, if we wanna find vector z minus vector x? Uh, and here's our component forms. Let's go ahead and find uh, if we took uh, negative 2 minus negative 1. That's the same as negative 2 plus 1. That would give me negative 1, right? And let's do the same thing for our delta y components. Negative 4 minus 4 gives me negative 8, right? Now, let's go ahead and plot these and see if we graphically came up with the with the right answer. See if our vector operations are working for us here. And there's my y-axis. Okay. And I'm going to put my x-axis right about here. And let's go ahead and plot these vectors individually. Let's plot z first because we're going to subtract vector x from z. So let's plot z. Uh, z is at negative. If we put it in standard position, we're going to go over to down 4. Here's vector z right here. Good. Okay. Okay. And vector x is at negative 1, 4. So if I put it in standard position, its terminal point is going to be at negative 1, 4. Over 1, up 4. Good. Okay. That's vector x. Vector x. And we found our resultant of subtracting vector x from vector z was going to be at negative 1, negative 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it should be down here. Hmm, does that make sense? Let's see. Let's think about this for a second. Here's our resultant vector. Okay, so I would say this is vector z minus vector x. So don't forget that if we're subtracting vector x, we're going to be, that's the same as adding the opposite. So how do I negate this vector? I'm going to flip it 180 degrees. Just bring it right around. So instead of going negative 1 up 4, I'm going to go positive 1 down 4. Okay. And if you, if you do it properly, it should create a straight line right through the origin. So that's, this is actually, you can go ahead and draw it and call it negative vector x, because that's what it is. And now I feel pretty comfortable about this result, right? Because you can see your parallelogram. Your parallelogram is going to fit right in there, no problem. You can just kind of put a little dashed line in there if you want to just put in your check parallelogram. So vector operations working good for subtracting vectors as well. All right, what if we wanted to throw in a scalar op operation here uh, on one of our vectors? Uh, it, could we find two times vector y plus vector z? Uh, so our scalar operations tell us to get two times vector y. I am basically going to multiply those components by two. So two times three is six. Two times one is two. Okay, so now I've got this vector 2y. So we can go ahead and add that to vector z. If we were to add and we wanted to come up with 2y plus vector z, we would get 6 plus negative 2 gives me 4 and 2 plus negative 4 gives me negative 2. 
good. Let's go ahead and see if we can just confirm this. If we took and plotted our uh, vector to y, we would be at uh, 6, 2 if we put it in standard position. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up 2. Good. There's our vector 2y. Good. I'll label that 2y. And let's plot our vector z, which is negative 2, negative 4. Again, right there. Okay. And so that's our vector z. And we found that our resultant is going to be at 4, negative 2. Negative 2 right there. Okay. And hopefully you can see it. Our parallelogram method confirms that that is our resultant of 2 times vector y plus vector z. It's going to get us right there. See that parallelogram? Good. Okay, all right, Dave's going on an adventure. He's canoeing due east across a river at four miles per hour. The river is flowing south at three miles per hour. What is the resultant speed and direction of the canoe? Okay, well, let's draw these two vectors. There's two vectors in this problem. Dave's canoeing due east across a river at four miles per hour. That's your vector. It's got magnitude and uh, direction. So Dave, let's call this vector D for Dave, four miles per hour, four miles per hour, and he's going due east, okay? If the river is flowing due south at three miles per hour, there's our other vector. Let's call this vector R for river, going three miles per hour south, okay? So what's the resultant speed and direction of the canoe? You can picture if you're canoeing across a flowing river, and if you wanted to go straight across it, but the river is flowing, you're going to end up going in a slightly di different direction and with a slightly different velocity. If you're going upstream, it's a lot harder than if you're paddling downstream. Uh, because when you're going upstream, you got to subtract that vector of the flowing river. And since he's going orthogonal to the to the river he's we're not going to just add and get you know four plus three is seven miles per hour there's going to be some resultant speed and direction here what's it going to be <clears throat> well we could do our parallelogram method here and figure this out we can just draw this graphically here's our resultant we'll call it um i can't call it r because i already used this is going to be vector r good but we could say that this is vector r plus vector d that's our result okay how fast is he actually going to be going well you could give yourself a right triangle here or a right triangle here because this was due east and this was due south so that was a right angle there so i could say well, my triangle has these sides of 4 and 3. And so my distance should equal the square root of my change in x squared plus my change in y squared. It should equal the square root of 4 squared plus 3 squared. You guys might recognize a Pythagorean triple here <clears throat> because 16 plus 9 gives you 25, right? So... He's actually going five miles per hour, thanks to the little bit of help he's getting from the river. And the question is, <clears throat> what direction is he going? Um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to not use that theta. I'm going to use this theta so we can write it as a bearing, which we would usually write in reference to if this is south and this is east. Okay, so let's find theta here. Well, theta is going to be an angle whose, if this side is 4 and this side is 4 miles per hour, theta is an angle whose tangent is opposite over adjacent, 4 over 3. 4 over 3. And can I calculate that? You bet I can. I can use my inverse tangent, second function tangent, 4 divided by 3, and we get theta equals 53.1 degrees. So 
he's no longer heading due east. He's heading south 53.1 degrees towards the east. And that's how you'd write that as a bearing. All right, one more quick example, guys, and then we'll be done with this lesson. Uh, Dave's now, uh, he's upgraded from a canoe to a kayak. Uh, so he's kayaking across a lake now at seven miles per hour due east. Okay, here's Dave going seven miles per hour due east. Good. So this is east. And the lake is flowing south at four miles per hour. So let's call that vector L four miles per hour okay so which direction is dave actually going in let's give ourselves since this uh don't forget that's a right angle the angle between due east and south and we can make ourselves a little parallelogram which conveniently in this case happens to be a rectangle he's actually going to be going in this direction because this is vector l plus vector d that's his resultant and how fast will he be going? Well, here's, why don't we take a look at this? Let's call this our angle theta, and let's call this side seven miles per hour. And we can see that the distance of, or the length of this vector is gonna be the square root of the change in x squared, seven squared, plus the change in y squared, four squared. So distance equals the square root of 49 plus 16. And I think we get the square root of 65. Now, this is one of those cases where I, you know, I love to leave things as exact answers and leave them in radical form. But maybe Dave doesn't know what you're talking about when you tell him he's going the square root of 65 miles per hour. So you can go ahead and turn that into a decimal if you must, because it's approximately 8.1 miles per hour that he's going. Okay. And how are we going to find his direction? Let's write it as a bearing. He's going south so many degrees east. Okay, so this angle theta would be, could we say it is an angle whose tangent is 7 over 4, opposite over adjacent, 7 over 4. And we're going to get second function tangent, 7 divided by 4 is sixty point three degrees we'll call it okay so he is going south 60.3 degrees east at a speed of 8.1 miles per hour good all right that's vectors guys and that is pretty much that pretty much wraps up chapter eight uh for uh, for the honors class i will be doing a few extras on uh, some other trig functions but that pretty much wraps up our unit on trigonometry. Good luck on the homework.